what is the most common objection raised against the existence of God? And that is evil and suffering in the world. So, in other words, this, this is meant to be that if God really does exist, this stuff wouldn't happen. But since it does happen, then God does not exist. Uh, now, whenever this topic comes up, there's always a first move that you've got to make. If somebody mentions this, I don't believe God exists. There's too much evil and suffering in the world. So whenever you hear that, there's always a first question you've got to start with. And rather than just give it to you, I want to show you another clip. Uh, now this one comes from the movie Batman vs. Superman. I can tell you I watched too many superhero movies, uh, but it's fun. Um, but this one comes from Batman vs. Superman, and this, this is a perfect one for this class. This is Lex Luthor talking to Superman about the problem of evil. And I want you to listen very carefully for two things. Number one, he clearly identifies what the problem is. And then based on what he is saying, I would ask you, how would you respond to Lex Luthor? Assuming he wasn't trying to cause chaos and destruction in the world. Let's put that part aside. Um, how would you respond to Lex Luthor? So let's, let's see this. Up here. Mm. Mm. Uh, the, mm, the problem of, of evil in the world. Uh, the problem of absolute virtue. I'll take you in without breaking you, which is more than you deserve. The problem of you on top of everything else. You above all. Ah, because that's what God is. Horus, Apollo, Jehovah, Kal-El, Clark, Joseph, Kent. See, what we call God depends upon our tribe, Clark Joe. Because God is tribal. God takes sides. No man in the sky intervened when I was a boy to deliver me from daddy's fists and abominations. Mm, I figured out way back. If God is all powerful. He cannot be all good. And if he is all good, then he cannot be all powerful. All right. Uh, what is the first thing? Now, again, let's, let's assume that this isn't Lex Luthor trying to cause destruction, but you hear somebody say that, what is the first question you would ask? If somebody says, I don't believe God exists, there's too much evil and suffering in the world, you want to ask, why do you say that? Because you want to understand whether they're coming from this from an emotional perspective or an intellectual perspective. Now, based on what he said, where is he coming from? Emotional. Dad's fist, right? So. If somebody is suffering from this topic of pain and suffering and evil in the world, do we want to launch into a variety of uh, apologetic responses, a theodicy, intellectual answers? No. It's going to seem callous. It's going to seem cold. It's not going to be helpful. So if someone is struggling emotionally, we have a much different response, right? So here's some people who are suffering emotionally, and what we want is to just be there, right? This, this goes back to the story of Job, right? Say, say little. You can be there, you can listen. If appropriate, certainly be praying for them. They're a Christian, be praying for them. Um, but this is the response if somebody is suffering emotionally. So that's always the first question to start with, is why do you say that? Pull out a little bit more information, right? Uh, now let's assume, for the rest of the class, we're talking about the intellectual side of this. That somebody says, I can't reconcile these two. I can't reconcile how God exists, God's all good, God's all powerful, yet he doesn't intervene in the pain and suffering. And there are people who have walked away from the faith based on this. My understanding is if you've heard of Bart Ehrman, who was a Christian and now is not a believer, and he left the faith. He's a very famous historian. He has left the faith primarily because of the problem of evil. He can't reconcile them. So this is something I think we've got to be uh, uh, well-versed in, recognize the right timing, uh, because when people have questions on this, we've, we've got to be able to provide some answers. And I would say this. It's not just Christians who need to give an answer for this. Everybody 
if you're going to have a coherent worldview of religion, needs to give an answer of why there's evil in the world. Atheists, Muslims, Buddhists, Hindu, any of them. You've got to have a coherent view of why there is evil in the world. It's not just a Christian explanation. All right, let's summarize the, uh, the, the contention here. Now again, we may not use these words, but this is the problem of evil summarized in a nutshell. If God is all-powerful, then he can defeat evil. He has the capability, the ability to defeat evil if he's all-powerful. If God is all good, then he would desire to defeat evil. But evil is not defeated, keeps happening in the world. Hence, there is no all-powerful, all-good God. Now, do people use those, those terms? No. But that's, that is what is behind this when somebody says there's too much evil in the world for God to exist. So, um, I want to start, before I give you a response, I want to talk about what evil is and what evil is not. And I got another movie clip for you. This one's quicker. It's not superheroes, but it comes from the movie Time Bandits. Um, I don't know if you remember this one. I saw this as a kid. 1981 uh, movie from the UK. It is a kind of a fantasy adventure kind of kids movie. And there is an evil one who gets destroyed at the end. So if I've ruined it for you, it's been 40 years. Uh, he gets destroyed at the end, but he is pure evil. And they are cleaning it all up and they miss a piece. And this is where it picks it up at the end. Uh, you can see the uh, kind of the, the flip here. Usually it's parents saying don't do something and the kids do it. This is the kids saying don't do something and the parents do it. Um, but anyways, I, I like this clip because it, um, it shows the opposite of what is true from a Christian worldview perspective. That evil is not a substance per se. Evil is not a substance. What evil is... Oh, actually, you know, let me hit this first because... Um, you may, get this, you may get this question. <clears throat> in Isaiah 45, doesn't the Bible say that God created evil? You'll see it here. Depending on the interpretation, it says, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I am Jehovah that doeth all these things. So some people will say, well, wait a minute. Did God create evil? Now, this word is the word ra in Hebrew and can take on multiple meanings. So um, we would say this is not the best interpretation. God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. So God would not and could not create evil because there's only light in him. And so a lot of the other newer interpretations and literal interpretations like the NASB say creating disaster. And this is very much an acceptable definition Instead of just evil, it could be God creating or bringing about disaster, calamity, etc. And one more point I just want to mention is this also aligns better if you look back at Genesis 131. After God created everything, it says God saw that all he had made and behold, it was very good. So we would not have recorded this if God had created not only good, but had created evil, everything that God had made at that time was very good. So this is the more appropriate um, explanation here. Moreover, if you look at Isaiah 45, there are elements around there as consequences to wrong behavior. And so that's why that's a better fit for what's happening here is judgment or calamity or disaster. So all, all I'm trying to say is that God the not, could not did not create a substance that is evil. In other words, you could not go find something on the periodic or whatever that is a substance of evil, like in Time Bandits where they touched. That's, but, but we're going to get to God created the potential for it. Okay, so let's go with uh, an understanding what evil is from a Christian perspective. We would say it's the corruption or it's the lack of a good thing. It's not a substance itself but the lack of a good thing or the corruption of a good thing. And one illustration is like rust to a car. It's something bad 
that happens to metal. So evil is something bad that has happened to this very good world that God has created. Um, this is another example. Uh, and you might recognize this, this little boy. We're going to come back to this. But he was born uh, with Tetra Amelia, which is a very, very rare disease where you can um, be born and not have your limbs, your arms and your legs. Uh, and we're going to come back to this. We're going to come back to this. He is famous. You did. All right. We're going we're to come back to this one. Um, okay. There are also two types of evil. There's moral evil. And this is when personal agents who can make moral decisions choose to do something against the will of God. So, and I'm, I'm saying personal, personal agents because this is certainly human beings, but it's also angelic beings, right? Uh, we've got demons that are angels with bad hearts, is what a demon is. So, uh, personal agents that can make moral decisions can bring about moral evil. And then you've got natural evil. You've got volcanoes, you've got diseases, you've got earthquakes, etc. So, our what they call theodicy is an explanation of why God allows evil has <coughs> got to account for both of these, right? Now again, this is not just a Christian topic. Every coherent view has to give a response to this. Um, this is the most common, is the free will defense. Uh, and the perspective here is that God has not created us like robots and wired us to always behave in a certain way. That's what you know, robots are wired, uh, programmed to behave a certain <coughs> way. That's not the way we are. God has truly given us the ability to make good decisions and bad decisions. And we would argue that that is a necessity in order to have a genuine love relationship, right? If God wired us to just do good and love him, would that be a genuine love relationship? I would, would say no. So we have to have a, a true ability to choose to follow our creator and maker or to rebel. Uh, now, which type of evil does this account for? It's the moral evil. You, and this goes back to what, you know, what God, when he created all of, uh, of nature, and gave angels and he gave human beings the ability to choose and have free will, this gave the potential for evil. So God is not causing evil, he's not creating a substance or causing evil, but he allowed for it to come into existence based on, on free will. And free will is extremely important uh, because, you know, based on free will, some people are going to hell. So this has got to be of utmost importance to God this, this notion of free will, if it's going to bring about bad things and it's going to uh, lead some people to hell by having this, uh, this ability to make choices. Uh, now the question is, is this biblical? Right, so I don't want to just give you philosophical answers today. I want to ground everything in scripture. And there are a number of scriptures we could point to. One of the... Um, uh, Oh, let me just give you a couple here. Both of these are from Jesus. So Jesus answered then and said, My teaching is not my own, but his who sent me. If anyone is willing to do his will. So notice Jesus' words very carefully. He's talking about people. If anyone, any person, is willing to do God's will. So right there he is saying that we all have a will. We can choose to do his will or not do his will. Here's another one, and this is Jesus talking, he's saying, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who have been sent to her, how often I wanted, Jesus is saying, how often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. So Jesus is, you know, he's talking as uh, the as God, as a father, as he wanted to gather his chicks, his children under his wings, but they were not willing because they had a different will than God. And you can find this throughout Scripture, 
You know, we know um, Joshua said this, Choose today who you'll follow. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Um, so free will is, you know, throughout Scripture. It is very much a biblical view. And I think it is a good explanation for moral evil. Now, some people would go so far as to say it even accounts for natural evil. Uh, because when Adam and Eve, with their free will, chose poorly, one of the consequences was that God cursed creation. And so now creation is cursed because of a poor decision and a rebellion by Adam and Eve. Um, but we can go further. We can go further with that. All right. The next big one here is that God allows evil to continue because there is some good that supersedes the pain and the suffering. Now I'm going to tell you right off the bat, I think the best way to understand this is um, to know that the chief purpose of life is not happiness here. Right? It is knowledge of God. It is sharing that knowledge with others. Uh, but if you don't have that perspective, if your perspective is, I just want to be happy here and God is responsible for making me happy, this won't make sense. But if the chief purpose is not happiness, but something better, then this can make sense. So let's just give an example. Let's say somebody was hurting for whatever reason. And that eventually drove them to a place of worshiping and loving and following God and eternal salvation. Is the pain worth it? Absolutely. So this temporary, you know, C.S. Lewis talks about this, this moment of affliction is producing in us a weight of glory that is absolutely worth it. Now the problem, the hard part with this, is we don't always know what the good is. And it may not even be for us. Right? So we may go through some hard things, and we don't know that eventually something down the road is going to help somebody and benefit somebody else. There's no way as finite beings with limited knowledge that we are in position like God is to know a good that might come from something, either now or years later. Now, is this, um, is this biblical? And I, my favorite one with this is if you go back to the story of Joseph, remember this, where his brothers got a little jealous, threw him into the pit, sold him into slavery, he goes to Egypt, right? And... Then later on, they are bowing at his, in his presence, and then they're afraid. Oh my goodness, maybe he's, you know, they're gonna, uh, Joseph is going to remember all the bad things we did. And you remember this from Genesis 50, but Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result and keep many people alive. So the perspective here, Joseph is saying, God allowed this. God allowed this to put me in the right place to save Israel and a lot of other people. So this is, you know, one, um, one example of how the greater good is a biblical perspective. Another one you could easily identify is the crucifixion. Is this, was, that a, was that a good thing, the crucifixion? No, that was, a, that was a bad thing. Did it ultimately have a greater good? Obviously it goes without saying. There's no question providing a rescue plan for human beings. So this is very much a biblical perspective. Now, I want to, um, let me give you one more verse on this. Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials, knowing that testing your, of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect results so that you may be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. So sometimes it has a benefit for us as Christians. Now I'm going to show you two more reasons that for Christians on this. But first, let me go back and give you a couple examples. You remember this little boy here? Uh, this is Nicholas James Fujisidic. Fujisic. Fujisic. <laughs> um, he's from Australia. His parents were uh, Serbian immigrants from Yugoslavia. That's why he's got the last name that he has. But he was born with this disorder, and he's now a Christian evangelist and motivational speaker. And notice what he says. You know, I had the choice to be angry at God for what I don't have or be thankful for what I do have. And he has a perspective on this where, you know what, I've been, I've born this way, terrible, but it's become a good thing because I am 
speaking to people about truth and maybe impacting eternity in that regard. So he's one example, right? Uh, there's lots of examples. You've got uh, John Newton. He said, I have reason to praise God for my trials, for most probably I should have been ruined. I would have been ruined without them. You know John Newton you know, wrote um, Amazing Grace, other hymns, etc. He was involved in slave trade. He actually became a slave at one point, was mistreated. So he went through some hard things, eventually became a Christian and an abolitionist. And he's saying, well, thank goodness for my trials because they brought me to where I am. Um, here's another one. You know this one, Helen Keller, right? This is the movie. Um, and uh, she was sick at the age of 19 months lost her eyesight, lost her hearing, and, and then, I think, was it Anne Frank? Is Anne that? Sullivan. Anne Sullivan, thank you. Yeah, I knew it was Anne somebody. Anne Sullivan came uh, to be her teacher, and notice what she says here. She says, I thank God for my handicaps, for through them I found myself, my work, and my God. Now again, is this always the case where something bad happens to us, and it, it helps us, not always, right? So it might be a trickle effect or a domino effect that might help a different generation. We're not in position to know, but we have to trust God as sovereign that he is allowing certain things for a greater good. Okay, um, and this is what C.S. Lewis, he wrote a lot on this. He says, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. And I think this is so true, right? If everything were perfect in this world, would all of us be seeking God? I think a lot of people would not, right? So he is allowing this for a greater good. All right, um, this is a different one. This is around, uh, these last two are specifically for Christians. So one is discipline. For whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he punishes every son whom he accepts. It's for discipline that you endure, God deals with you as a... So, again, we may have things happen to us that we don't love. There could be some suffering and whatnot, but maybe God is helping us to see the implications of disobedience. So it can be stuff around discipline. And you, we can recognize this for our own children, right? Illustrations of, you know, uh, you bring that three-year-old in for a shot of medicine, and they look at you like, why are you allowing this? And they don't realize and stuff, so, right? So... I think, you know, God has set it up this way as a model so we can have a little bit of a glimpse into how he as a father loves his children and allows certain things. So. Uh, there's another one here. Share in the suffering. Part of what we may experience, and I, I'm afraid to say it's going to ramp up in this country, is we're going to share in the suffering just by being followers of Christ. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake not only to believe in him, but also to suffer on his behalf. So sometimes we may go through periods of suffering just because we are part of the family of Christ. Um, I got a few minutes here. I'm going to show you a little bit of a clip here. Uh, you'll recognize this person. Um, but he is going to talk a little bit about his pain and suffering that he went through in prison. You wonder probably why I smile. It is because I wish to convey to you the joy of those who suffer for Christ in communist prisons. We think about their sufferings, and their sufferings are really huge. In red China, Christians are burned with red hot iron pokers. They are pelted with stones while tied on crosses. Others are buried alive. In Russia, prisoners are compelled to stand the whole day barefoot on the ice. In northern Siberia, where the ice never melts, all kinds of physical tortures are used the sophisticated methods of brainwashing. But this is only one side of the story.
prison is not hell. In hell there is no water. We have water. We have rivers of living water. I was in a cell like this. During three years, I and many other prisoners, Christians, were kept in such solitary cells 30 feet below the earth. During three years, out of my 14 years of prison, I never saw sun, moon, snow, stars, flowers, trees, I had forgotten that these exist. You never heard a noise in that prison. People would believe that it has been only deep suffering. But when I remember that time, I remember it as a glorious time. The bride was in the embraces of the heavenly bridegroom. We received his holy kiss we knew his caresses. It has been one of the most beautiful times of my life. But not about my life and my prison I wish to speak to you. I am free now. Hundreds of thousands are in prisons today. Watchmen Ni, Wan Min Dao, Sister Sung in China, Aida Skripnikova, Khrapov, Prokofiev in Russia, Boyan, Georg Alexandru in Romania, and so many in other communist countries. They sit in cells exactly like this, alone. Alone, is it really alone? God is there, Christ is with them, and the holy angels fill this cell. And for the first time, being in solitary confinement, we realized the truth of what is written in Hebrews, that a cloud of witnesses, those who have suffered for Christ's sake in times before, encompass around us. They are not somewhere far away. They were with us in our cells, giving us strength, encouraging us by their beautiful examples, feel with those in chains, as if you yourself would be bound together with them, share their suffering, but share also their joy and share their victory. All right, so for sake of time, we'll stop there. Notice you said this is one of the most beautiful times of my life because he was not alone. He was in the presence of God. Um, but, again, just goes back to the perspective is that we may have to suffer here for the sake of Christ as being with part of the family uh, of God. So, again, why does God allow evil and suffering? There's free will. It could be a greater good. It could be discipline. Um, it just might be that we're going to experience torment because of the family we're part of. Also, it can just be judgment. I go that goes back, I think, to free will, is that sometimes it could be bad things because God is bringing judgment for disobedience. Um, now, in the last couple of minutes here, I just want to hit a couple more slides. Um, the interesting thing about the problem of evil is that in certain sense, this actually proves the existence of God. It goes back to, I think it was class three, we talked about morality. And mora morality, the moral standard, either comes from human beings, it is within us, or the moral standard is outside of us. But if the moral standard is outside of us, then the source must be outside of us, and God is the best explanation. So when we say there's evil in the world, is that like something just like a personal preference, or is there really something wrong with the world? I think it's obvious evil shows us that there is an objective good and evil outside of our opinions and our preference. And so this actually proves there's a standard outside of us and there must be a moral lawgiver. This is kind of the way that C.S. Lewis was describing this because this was a powerful argument for why he came to believe in God. He says, as an atheist, my argument against God was the universe seems so cruel. 
and unjust. But how had I gotten this idea of just and unjust? Where does this justice, unjustice come from? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? So where does justice and unjustice come from? And he's saying this is pointing to an objective moral law giver, God. All right, last thing I want to hit is I want to um, talk about Jesus in his most clear teaching on the problem of evil. This is Jesus' most clear teaching on the problem of evil. So uh, now on that very occasion, there were some present who reported to him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. So this is murder. This is murder. And Jesus responded and said to them, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans just because they have suffered this fate? That was the notion back then, right? If you were suffering, well, what did you do wrong? What did your family do wrong? And Jesus is saying, do you think they're worse sinners? No. That's not the case. Now, this is moral evil. No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So he's clarifying their misunderstanding. You're all guilty. You're all guilty. Now take your focus and put it where it needs to be on repentance. So he points them where they should be thinking about, and that is repentance. That's moral evil. Now you've got what? Tower of Siloam. Or do you think that those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them were worse offenders than all the other people who live in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So he dealt with actually both of these moral and natural evil. And he pointed them to what was ultimately most important, their repentance, because that was uh, in impact eternity. Okay, so here's, this is, uh, in summary, God allows evil for a greater good, since the purpose of life is not happiness, but knowing God.